Minister of Basic Education is here. We also want to take this opportunity to recognize the representatives from Anglo-American Platinum as well as Impala Platinum Mine, the CEO, Mr. Mark Monroe. Thank you for being here this morning. We are not going to waste time. I'm going to ask the Minister of Basic Education to come through to address the media. But I need to also say that we have the CEO of the National Education Collaboration Trust, Mr. Godwin Corsa, with us. And we also have the CEO of uh, Rand Water. But I also need to say that the Director General of the Department of Basic Education is there, Mr. Matan Zimamuel. He also has a presentation that is going to make, but all of that will come after the Minister is taken to the stage to address us. Minister, I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, please uh, ascend to the stage. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Elijah. Let me acknowledge the Premier, the Temkoro, my colleague, the MEC of Education in Northwest, the leadership of Platinum Mine uh, that gave us a beautiful school. Thank you very much, uh, CEO. Also acknowledge our DG, the Temweli, and the school leadership, the principal and the staff who have really kept this school in a very good state. Uh, I had the privilege to receive the school in my previous term and it's as I left it. So congratulations to principal. From the outset, I really have to acknowledge the furor that of the postponement of yesterday's media conference and for that I sincerely apologize. Due to last minute changes and as I think the media will be aware that on Saturday we had the CEM and after the CEM we met with our unions, the governing bodies, but also received their reports and we met for a, almost the whole day on Saturday. And the decision that we took on Saturday forced me to use Sunday to do a series of consultations because on Saturday we had taken the decision not to, not to receive learners today. But it had major implications for the sector because it was very late by the time that decision was taken there were learners which were on their way to schools, especially from school from outside provinces. There were principals who were not aware of the decision that we took on Saturday. So I spent almost the whole of Sunday consulting. So as I said, I was forced into a number of consultations with a number of key stakeholders who have a direct interest in basic education and resulting in challenges for me to continue with the press briefing we had planned. Because I didn't want principals to first hear from the media that they can't receive learners before we speak to them directly. So I had to engage with association of school principals. I had to engage with leadership of schools, both private and independent, because they were also using the date and they are not part of the public system and they had to be told already by Sunday that there was a decision that uh, we had taken on Saturday. I also had to communicate to get into a meeting for 
uh, South African Human Rights Commission because itself also was threatening uh, interdiction, so I had to also spend time with them. I also had to spend time with organizations representing learners with special needs. And I really want to re repeat that. I really want to wish to apologize wholeheartedly for the inconvenience that was caused yesterday. But it was beyond my control because I had to make sure that all key stakeholders are informed in time so that they can mitigate all the challenges which have been brought by the decision that we took very late on Saturday. So if you recall on, on the 19th of May 2020, I did announce a phase opening of schools as from the 1st of June. Following the, that announcement, our department convened a number of meetings on a weekly basis and sometimes uh, more than twice a week. I had to engage with heads of provincial education departments to prepare the system for the new environment. I had to engage with teacher unions about the new environment we have to operate under, with your national school governing bodies, with your principals associations, with the different NGOs working in the sector, but also organizations working with learners with special needs. We had to engage with assessment bodies to make sure that indeed with the new environment, there will, be there will be necessary changes to our assessment system. And a series of stakeholders with a direct interest in basic education. So we had to consult with everybody else who works with us. As I said, some of these meetings were convened on a weekly basis and some more than once a week. And the main focus of, of these meetings was to collaborate with our key stakeholders and to put in place measures to ensure the readiness of the system for the phase in reopening of schools. As indicated in the earlier media briefing, critical to the reopening of schools was and still remains absolute compliance with all health safety requirements pronounced by the Department of Health. So on the 30th of May, which is this past Saturday, we again meet, met as Council of Education ministers to have our final report because we've been receiving these weekly reports. And we received three critical reports. The first of the State of Readiness report, which we will receive from, which we received from the NECT. And I did invite them today to really give you, you a sense of what were the tools they were using and what, is, what were the recommendations that they made after giving us that final report. We also received a report from Rainwater, and I've also invited them to really also come and assure the nation from their reports that uh, we are already, we are indeed on the right track so that our extension of the school's opening was it's informed by the finalization of the work that they're doing for us will also be here, so they're here to also speak for themselves. But we also as a sector, because we also work with province or a concurrent structure, I had to meet with my colleagues from provinces and receive reports from different provinces in terms of their state of readiness and their state of unreadiness. So those were the three reports that informed our decision late on Saturday. So based on these reports, it became clear that the sector was at different levels of readiness. And as you recall that we were allowed to open schools only if we meet the health requirements to the full. So those reports confirmed that in some instances we were 80%, in other provinces, in other provinces we were 96%, but we were not all at the same level. And in the main, it was this reason that the CM determined that the sector requires more time to mop up its state of readiness for schools reopening. And as I will speak to that about what were still outstanding matters. But I can speak to some of them off the cuff because on Thursday I visited a number of schools. In Gauteng on Friday I went to the Free State. 
I went to the first school in Olive and Holt, and the principal was wearing techies with her staff, and they were doing everything possible to ready themselves from Monday. And the principal whispered to me and said, you know, Minister, we are here all the time. We leave the school very late, but let me tell you, I will not be ready to teach on Monday. Because the things we had to do are things that ourselves had not anticipated that we'd have to do. Because the most difficult part was reorganizing the curriculum, getting teachers who were not teaching grade 12 to, and just those decisions around the curriculum took the schools a long, long time to come to conclusion. But in terms of your protective clothing, on Thursday, they were only delivering the, PP, the, the protective equipment by the province for learners. So which means learners will not have been informed already by Friday. So it's a fact. So I think it answers other questions that I anticipate you will ask. That it's a fact that I can confirm that by the time I went to certain schools, there were schools that were not ready. From Oliver and Holt Bosch, I went to, 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 to Midrand Secondary. Again, the principal, the vice principals were having tape measures. Because one thing that we had not thought through properly uh, 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 at DG, we had a schedule on the arrival of teachers and didn't make a schedule on the arrival of other support staff. And you would have expected principals themselves running schools would have closed the gap. So when I went to Ivory Park, it was the principal and the vice principal who was busy doing measuring of distances, whereas they had spent the whole week dealing with curriculum issues. Whereas if we had really planned properly, the support staff was supposed to have arrived with the principal and do all the other administrative work. Even the principal of Ivory Park said to me, Minister, by Monday I'll receive kids, which means I'm going to be inducting learners and teachers at the same time. We are sure we'll be finished by Sunday, but we have not met all the requirements and the steps that we have put for us. I proceeded to go to Kempton Park, and they were, they were beyond what we had asked. They had inducted teach, uh, parents, not only teachers, they had inducted parents, they had orientated their learners, they were ready, ready to move. Everything was in place. But the, even there, the principal said to me, when my teachers came here, the anxiety in their faces tells me that on Monday, we will not be able to teach these learners. We have to really calm them down because it took me time to settle teachers. So I'm just giving an example of our experience. You say there are schools which are very ready. There were schools that were not ready. On Friday, I went to the Free State. They were beyond ready. When I, one school which I went to, I found them already inducting and orientating their learners. Because they themselves also are saying when the teachers arrived, they were very anxious and they felt that if they were to teach on Monday, they must induct their learners. They had called parents, showed them all the health protocols to reassure them about the safety. Because as you remember, we all said, uh, everybody is anxious and it's very important for us to keep on reassuring each other. So as a result of those reports, as I say, we took a decision to say, let's use this week to mop up. But it's a decision we took very late on Saturday when we had our final report. And there were different views to say, why don't we let the schools that are ready to proceed because it will kill the momentum if we say they must not proceed. And focus on the schools that were not ready, because some will be ready at different times. I'm giving an example of Ivory Park. The principal said, at least by Tuesday, I'll be ready to teach. The principal of Oliver and Holt said, I'll be ready by Wednesday. So which means we're all unready. But the decision was that there were other key factors around safety, for the coronavirus which have not been satisfied like water therefore it will be risky to have a blanket opening of schools and it took us long on saturday to arrive at that so on sunday i had to spend 
the whole day speaking to private schools because they also needed reassurance, we had to agree, I had to speak to... So it was a series of people that we had to consult with and I'm still explaining why I had to call the media off because I just could not jump other steps, especially with people who were affected because principals needed to know by yesterday, what do they do? Do they phone parents? Do they send uh, messages to say parents must not bring children? And that's what took long. So I want to say again, I'm very, very sorry. But based on these reports, it became quite clear that the sector was at different levels of readiness. In the main, it was for this reason that CEM, your Council of Education Ministers, determined that the sector requires just more time to mop out the state of readiness for, for school reopening in order to comply with the health and safety standards of COVID-19. So the Saturday uh, CM resolved that teachers whose schools have already received the personal protective equipment will be expected to report at work on the 1st of June. So we're expecting teachers to come today and I'm glad the first school I went to they have a full complement of teachers. They had 25 teachers in their books. They had 25 teachers. But even then it was qualified that if they have received, because the report was saying as late as Saturday there are schools which had not received their protective equipment from their provinces. And when they arrive, those teachers have to prioritize the preparation of their work to deal with a new normal brought about by the coronavirus. And that new normal meant different and new tasks for teachers because even here the principal was telling me that she had, she had five classes. We said five, two classes for metric. We have five. Now you are at eight. So which means teachers were not teaching grade 12, now have to teach grade 12. And therefore you have to work out in terms of your staffing deployment, how do you deploy your teachers? And that was not an easy one because I think as schools who have this tendency of saying your most experienced or most skills go to grade 12, the others, so we've had to reorganize ourselves. So as provinces, we also agree that we must finalize all outstanding deliveries of your PPEs to schools and the outstanding provision of water and sanitation. Because by Sunday when we met, Rainwater gave us a report. They had not finished. They had, I think they'll speak for themselves. There were schools that they had not delivered tankers to. They're only arriving today. And teachers and support staff should be inducted and orientated for the new environment brought by COVID-19. Well, it's the very same teachers who have to be armed with all the necessary information who in return have to support and induct learners. So some of them obviously will not have been inducted by Friday or Saturday. Therefore, we've agreed that schools which have not inducted people, they should do the induction. And again, as I say, when I was in the free state, it was a health department, I was a doctor and nurses, which were teaching our staff about the virus and all sorts of things and working out the protocols of, link of linkages between themselves. And we also agreed that provinces should finalize the training of screeners. Because again, screeners were appointed, they had not arrived at schools, but other provinces had done it. I'm told the MEC tells me that she had trained all her screeners, she had trained all her school nutrition team, uh, 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 members, and also volunteers that had come to assist us. Because what is going to happen in the first weeks, especially in the primary schools, we have to help force our children to understand the new environment. Uh, there are going to be different assembly points, they're not going to be able to interact with their friends. They're going to have different breaks. They're going to leave the school at different times. So it's a new environment because they must not be crowded at the same place. So all those logistics have to be sorted out. So come next week, everybody knows where the assembly point is. You see, MC, when I went to the Free State, there were even color coding classes to say the yellow only assemble there, they don't go anywhere else. The green only assemble there. The yellow, so that even inside the school they are not able to interact and the whole area has been color coded in terms of the directions. 
But we also had to deal with processes related to independent schools. Right? So they had made their own submissions to say we are small. Some of them are small. So the reason for us to phase in is to allow us opportunity to start. It's not because we don't want all the learners here. It's to allow us to really create a COVID-19 compliance environment. And they say we have, how many inspectors we have. So we had to deal with those. We also had to deal with schools of learners with special needs. Because even those are different, they're therapeutic. They're a different space that we had to work through. So we did discuss, then we met after our decision with uh, MECs, then we met with teacher unions and the national school body associations to share with them our decisions to use this week to mop up and ensure that all the outstanding matters are attended to and agreed with them that this week is going to be a mopping period schools that have completed all the necessary steps should use this week for induction and orientation. So let me not repeat that. So what is happening now is that provinces are now putting their shoulder to the wheel to ensure that all prerequisites not yet fulfilled will be delivered within the week one of June. And together with our partners, agreed to another meeting on Thursday to continue to monitor and evaluate all outstanding compliance imperatives. For instance, we also had situations where, because we announced late our decision on Sunday, parents had started driving their kids to school. I mean, parents phoned me to say, I'm in the Eastern Cape, my child is in a boarding school, are you saying I must come back? So we had to deal with all the matters that really were a fallout because of the late decision. So we communicated, unfortunately quite late, that parents should not bring grade seven and learners 12, seven and 12 to schools, but teachers who have received their PPEs are expected to report for work and carry out their responsibilities as spelled out and more importantly, the, the sector agreed that the effective teaching and learning should resume on the 8th of June 2020. I've decided to also to take the nation to confidence with regards to the situation that we have faced. And that's why I've requested that the, C, the, the CEO of NECT should come to say what is, what is contained in the report that gave us the recommendations to take just another week for postponement. And I think I don't want to speak, uh, to spend lots of time on it because they will speak for themselves. And as I said earlier, I've also invited the Water Board to also assure the nation because that's one of the key deal breakers to say, indeed, on Thursday, when we meet, will the water tanks which are outstanding be in all the schools that are there? So, as I said, also based on, re on the reports that I received from provinces, I'm very hopeful that all outstanding challenges, they and earth, will be addressed during this period so that we can be able to start teaching. Because as I said, in the province, in my province, things were only arriving Friday, Saturday, so which means they've arrived. Then they can use this week to induct. But my view is that any further delays, it's not only my view, and also with my colleagues in provinces, poses a very serious threat to the system and the future of learners that are yearning for. Because it is poor learners who are going to be highly disadvantaged if we keep on postponing. They have not had the benefits, and I'm proud the principal says, she says when she opens next week, she'll be on term three. But she was able to continue interacting with her learners during the lockdown. But other learners have not had that privilege, so which means they have still have to do term two work during term three. And they're expected to write the same exam with learners whose teaching was not interrupted during the lockdown. But the other matter, because as I said, colleagues will speak to the other matters. I thought I should also go through the directives that we issued 
on Saturday. So on May the 29th, which is a Friday, as DBE, we issued a government gazette with directives regarding the reopening of schools and measures that address, prevent, and combat the spread of coronavirus in the basic education sector. And these directives were issued in terms of Regulation 4.3 of the regulations which were developed under the Disaster Management Act of 2002 and was published on 29 April 2020. And the main purpose of these directives is to provide the arrangements for a phase return of educators, officials, learners and support staff to schools and offices. Number one in those directives that in terms of the movement of people between provinces, because we have teachers coming from Eastern Cape teaching in Northern Cape, or teachers from Eastern Cape teaching in Western Cape. So in terms of the movement of people between provinces, metropolitan areas and districts, there will be a permit issued for officials and educators under alert level three, which means from today. We have to commute to and from work on a daily basis. And these permits will be issued by the heads of department or a delegated official. There will be a certificate issued to learners who have to commit to and from on a daily basis, which will be issued by a principal of a school, for instance, in your area like Paris, where kids study in the Val. Again, there must be a permit which is issued, and the issuing of the certificate must be done in compliance with the regulations. And even a person transporting a learner to school must also be issued with a permit. So again, the drivers themselves who, who drive kids up and down to school, they must have a permit. The regulations are also saying all extramural events at schools, including sports, choral, estate fort, or choral rehearsals, arts and other cultural festivals remain suspended. And we will talk about or that the minister will determine in conjunction with provinces if there is a need to lift some of these uh, limitations. So a parent, for instance, there's been questions about parents who still feel anxious about sending their kids to school because they're not very sure about their safety. The, the, the directives are saying a parent who chooses not to send a learner to school must apply to the head of the provincial education department who in the terms of the South African School Act can exempt a learner entirely, partially, or conditionally from compulsory attendance and if such an exemption is in the best interest of the learner. And a parent who chooses not to send the learner to school is obliged to apply for home education. So if your child doesn't have your underlying comorbidities, will fall under the second category because the head of department or the principal has to give an approval. So you can't keep your child at home to say, I'm anxious. And therefore, we find ourselves having to support you know. If it's reasons that the principal has not accepted, especially mainly around health issues. So a parent who chooses not to send a learner to school is, ob is obliged because basic education is compulsory. So education of children between, zero, between 6 and 15 is compulsory by law. So is obliged to apply for home education in terms of the relevant section of the South African School Act. So they must go and familiarize themselves with the conditions of homeschooling and comply because even then you have to apply. You just can't keep your child at home. You have to apply and meet all the conditions that are required under homeschooling. So we have been receiving many inquiries regarding the metric examinations and it is clear that a lot of anxiety on the, there's, there's lots of anxiety on the matter and we had to gazette it as well since it is also an extremely sensitive matter in the basic education system. So we've given directives formally that the May June 20 examination for candidates who registered for the senior certificate and national certificate is going to be administered in December. So those are your adult learners or your part-time learners 
So we had to agree with UMALUS, which is our examining body, that we will only assess those learners in December. Unless unforeseen circumstances occur, in which instance I, as the minister, will take the necessary determination. If anything happens, the country says we can't go to work for some reason. We will then have to take a new decision. But for now, the decisions that the learners were supposed to write in June will write in December. As indicated in all previous media briefings, the health and safety of learners, teachers, and all employees within the school, within schooling, are our major concern. And it is for these reasons that we must ensure that all schools comply with the minimum health and safety requirement and measures determined by health for a school to be able to, 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 to reopen. And again, there were concerns which were raised by the Human Rights Commission on this matter, MEC, to say, are we saying if schools don't comply, those children will have to suffer and their, schools is not, their school is not functioning. The right to education is an inalienable right for all learners. So which means ourselves as a sector will have to find alternatives for those kids to be able to access their rights without being prejudiced by the fact that we are not able to provide conducive conditions. So I thought I should clarify that because it has been coming repeatedly. That if we really find it impossible by the time we say there must be learning and teaching, as a sector, we have an obligation to find an alternative for those learners so that their rights to education is not compromised. Again, any school or office that does not comply with the minimum health and safety measures, such as schools or offices, will remain closed. I know some offices in Bulobedi Tiji, which are in the chief's uh, Office. So he gave them a rendezvous, all, all, all of them squashing that rendezvous. So obviously we, we can't operate from there any longer. So we have to find alternatives for those, for those officials, even if it means we send a mobile, but they, will, they can't operate the way they've been operating. Again, in keeping with the focus on health and safety, the directives clearly state that all offices and schools must develop a work plan. I must say, in the schools that I visited in the country, I did find COVID-19 files. Principal, I hope you have also a COVID-19 file. And we urge all schools to comply in this regard. Parents and guardians must not send their learners to a school if learners show any of the coronavirus symptoms. The screening, symptoms, the screening of symptoms must be conducted at offices of, or schools according to the Department of Health guidelines. We have since made this available to schools, again those guidelines, and we urge all teachers and relevant officials to familiarize themselves with the health guidelines. And I think that's what we would have observed, that every school, they will set up a station before you get into the main premise to test the temperature, screen, collect information on your age and everything else. So all schools are expected, and even offices, are expected on a daily basis to comply to those guidelines. So we agree that we need to work extremely hard to comply in order to prevent the infections, because that's a condition around which cabinet allowed us to open to say, when you say you are going back to schools, like all of, everybody else is going to back to work. Rule number one, you have to prevent infections in your workspace. So which means you have to put every measure in place that there is no infection in the workspace. So there are steps that we have, have been taken outlined in the directives to help us prevent the spread of the virus. Every office and school must have easily accessible and sufficient quantities of hand sanitizers based on the number of learners, of educators, officials, or persons who access the offices or school entrances. Offices and schools must have facilities for washing of hands with soap and clean water. The cleaning of surfaces and equipment is mandatory. A mask is a, a mask is a must in every instance. Offices and schools are required to provide a minimum of two cloth masks to learners and educators, officials and support staff. 
We have observed that schools have been working very hard also to configure the physical environment, from staff rooms to classrooms and the play areas. This is not a matter of choice. All of us must ensure that we comply with the social distancing requirements in order to comply with the health and safety requirements. The major challenge for us as a sector has been around the management of the curriculum and teaching. Since as of now, we have lost a whole term. It was from March to June, it's the second term. So we've lost a whole term. And we are likely to lose more days due to the virus. And as a sector, we had to be innovative in the manner we get school programs back on track. So in order to recover the teaching and learning time lost, the schooling system has to be re-engineered, resulting in the adjustment of timetables, and that's what most SMTs were engaged with, and the review of the curriculum in terms of the National Education Policy Act, which empowers me as the minister to determine a national policy for a curriculum framework, core syllabuses, and education programs. So we had established as DBE a curriculum work stream consisting of curriculum experts from the department and provinces, but we've also been working with academics and curriculum experts, experts in managing this aspect of the re-engineering of the curriculum. So because the basic education directives are not stated, we will always use the opportunity to make the necessary amendments as and when required. For instance, when I met the Human Rights Commission, they were concerned about Clause 4.2 to say when we, the directive said a school where a school not ready or not complying to the health requirements will not reopen, we will be prejudicing the rights of learners in that area when it's not their fault that things are not happening to, for them. And we explained that it meant the school infrastructure, not that learners will not as the department will be exempted from ensuring that those, the rights of those learners are realized. So once they, we, we agreed that there was a, a, a different interpretation of the clause, did they propose that we should speak to state law advisors that for the mere fact that different parties have a different interpretation of that clause, it means it's not clear enough and therefore we need to strengthen, so we'll do that. But there are also issues around that we had not considered earlier about ECD and all sorts of things. So as we proceed under level three, we will then make the necessary uh, 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 adjustments as we get inputs also from stakeholders and we'll make those public. So I must say, indeed, the national lockdown has affected our lives in so many levels. Families are traumatized, jobs are lost and schooling had grinded to a complete halt and the reopening under the new conditions was a real uphill as compared to other times when we have to count desks, count books, count teachers. Here we had to really create a new environment that we had not worked under before and it has caused lots of difficulties. But as I said, we were given strict orders by cabinet that schools should not spread the virus, we should make sure that no one is infected in the school premises, and that becomes a priority to everything that we do, and that's what also partly informed uh, the difficulties that we had to encounter during over the weekend in determining whether indeed we should send kids to school today when other provinces or schools have not met the requirements or we should use this week to mop up at least we know where the challenges are and we'll be focusing on those and schools that are ready like this school will then do the next step of orientating learners inducting them and counseling them and preparing them for learning and teaching next week so elijah i thought i should stop there and if you don't mind then get the two presenters so that we can then take questions if you don't mind
Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for the speech. Um, before we proceed to the presentation, um, I'd like to also acknowledge the, pres the presence of uh, the Executive Mayor of Bujanala District, uh, the District Municipality, Mr. Fetsang Mulusiwa. I also like to recognize the Mayor of Rustenburg, Rustenburg Local Municipality, Mr. Mpok No, as well as the HOD of the Education Department in the Northwest, Ms. Stefina Simaswe. We also have the Simaswe. Oh, that can that can the consultant, I always call her the HOD, so we, we get around uh, such difficulties like that, Minister. Um, we also have the administrator for the, the, the department, Mr. Joe Moshala. Minister, we've also been joined by Mr. Tebo Hojoala from Rendwater. We anticipated that connectivity would uh, work against us, but uh, we'll try to connect with the CEO. If that doesn't work, um, Mr. Joala is here to assist us. I'm going to now ask Mr. Godwin Corsa to come forward with the presentation. It's not going to be long, just to give us a sense of their findings from the work which they did as part of the mandate which they had been given by the department after the minister announced that a consortium had been appointed. Mr. Kosa. Um, Minister, Premier, uh, MSC, and the leadership of the province, DG, and um, the colleagues uh, from the department that are here, and of course the members of the media, um, good afternoon. It's 10 minutes before after. My, my, uh, my mental watch is, uh, be, you, know, in, you know, ahead. But good morning. You still have 10 minutes to enjoy the morning. Um, my name is Godwin Kosa from the National Education Collaboration Trust. And I'm presenting here a report of the consortium that comprises the Human Sciences Research Council, um, Antica Consulting, uh, Research 94 Plus and New Leaders Foundation who have you know, been set up under the leadership of the National Education Collaboration Trust to undertake the monitoring and evaluation of the preparation towards the readiness of the schools. And I'm going to share with you a report that we shared with the Department of Basic Education on Saturday, this past Saturday. Um, the, uh, Mr. Mklang, the logistics are just a bit challenging because I must present looking there. But nevertheless, um, as he indicated, it's not going to be a long you know, presentation. What I want to share with you is uh, the approach that we have taken, the uh, high level observations that we have made, as well as the recommendations that we have made to the Department of Basic Education um, on Saturday, um, <clears throat> this past Saturday. So, um, if you could turn it a little bit this side, uh, Terence. 
my sight is challenged. So I'm going to take this thing and walk closer. Oh. If you don't mind, I'll take, quickly take my laptop and we can just... Um, Okay, my humble apologies for the, the hiccup. Um, so, since we have collected the data on the readiness of the schools in the past, you know, 12 days, I'm counting up to now, the first big observation that we have made has been the consistent uh, observation of tremendous pressure that the education sector has been under to prepare for the return of the educators and the learners. We have also discerned the anxieties in the country and generally, generally and specifically in the surrounding, uh, surrounding the return of the schools. Thirdly, we have observed that the department has and is you know, continuing to collect different forms of relevant evidence from the various levels of the education system in order to help you know, make decisions from within uh, the Department of Basic Education. So what happened towards the end of last year is that we constructed a snapshot of the state of affairs as at the 27th of May 2020. And this was done with an anticipation that more work was still going to happen through the provincial departments, you know, through to the end of Sunday, the 31st of May um, Next is that we have, we actually, um, due to the fast-paced nature of the preparations, there has been some, you know, issues remain, relating to the limited completeness of information when we finalize the data, and you'll see some of those in my presentation. And of course, this has largely been to uh, the fast-paced nature that of the readiness preparations that I've indicated and the varying abilities of province, provincial departments to respond to um, the task of preparing schools as well as reporting, which uh, latter task was competing with the primary purpose of preparing the schools. So the work that we have, you know, the report that we presented on Saturday, you know, followed an engagement with a steering committee within the Department of Basic Education on matters pertaining to the methodology for the monitoring of the readiness. And we have subsequently presented the report on Saturday to the heads of uh, uh, education departments, as well as the Council of Education Ministers on, on Saturday. So the, the monitoring and evaluation has been crafted around very key questions. The first of which was, are schools ready to receive school management teams, teachers, and grades seven and 12 learners as the first you know, question. The second question had been, what is the level of readiness at the various levels of the system? So at provincial level, at district level, or circuit levels, as well as at school level. The third question, logically, uh, was what are the blockages to readiness if there are any and the next was what would have been the risks the health and safety risks in the schools and the last was just overall observations that you know we made about the readiness of the system so the summary observations that we made initially to uh, the heads of education departments 
in the morning on Saturday um, were five in number. The first is that we recognize that readiness is not an absolute measure, but a relative measure. And the understanding from that is that readiness actually, uh, the understanding of readiness comprises a number of expectations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. The second overall observation was that although much work to prepare the schools had taken place in the past three to four weeks, the absence of emergency response systems and culture has, had, has made it difficult to manage the readiness preparation. The third was the PPEs, personal protective equipment, tracking and verification that we undertook, which was initiated in the 10 days that I cited, pointed to a checkered state of readiness across the country. The fourth was that most of the provinces had procured and started distributing the PPEs largely for the school management teams and some provinces had started distributing for teachers and most of them were actually still preparing for the rollout of the um, learner PPEs. And the last broad observation was based on the PPE delivery tracking and data from the sample school surveys, we then made an overarching opinion, which was it was highly unlikely that majority of the schools nationally were going to be ready to open on Monday the 1st of June 2020. So there is lots of data that we have collected on when did each, for instance, on when did each province procure its material, where the procurement processes were, where, where the provinces had started distributing, and where the distribution process had reached at the various levels of the system, and whether the distributed amount of PPEs were going to be sufficient, at least for the staff and the learners who are doing grade seven and grade 12 expected in schools. So I'm not going to go through the details, but I'm going to share, you know, share with you um, the fact that in, in collecting all that data, we have started actually making some of the live systems that are available with um, the provinces. And we made the following overall observations. The first was some provinces were still procuring certain items. The second was that actually the closer we got to the distribution and the identification of what blockages were there, the more we re recognized that actually part of the challenges were from the supply side of things. There were shortages of stock, particularly cloth masks in the market. There was an undersupply of that. Um, some of the appointed suppliers did not have adequate stock themselves or the ability to produce those. And in fact, some of the suppliers misrepresented their abilities and capabilities to supply the PPEs. So you could have expected that that has had a knock-on effect on the pace of the delivery of the, of the PPEs. So various delivery methods were also um, adopted by different uh, um, provinces. You know, each province followed a different distribution model, some less effective than others, generally less automated, and with the number of PPEs that had to be rolled out to the schools, it was going to be difficult to manage you know, the magnitude of the problem with limited automated processes. This resulted in reporting being less effective. Deliveries are done at central stores in some cases, move to the districts for the districts and the circuits to then move to the schools. 
but there are a few provinces that had actually taken the route of di distributing directly to the schools. Um, from an administrative point of view, it became quite glaring that the supply chain uh, processes could not deal, in the, at the provincial level, could not deal with the emergency with which the PPEs had to be procured. The PPE procurement process was actually disrupted, was also disrupted by the withdrawal of the initial arrangements that provinces or government had to deliver PPEs through uh, the Treasury Instruction 3. So by the time that was changed, provinces had to put in place completely new you know, systems and identify where PPEs could be you know, procured and delivered to the schools. There are a whole range of other logistical you know, issues relating to transportation and distribution, as well as um, you know, uh, um, protests in some of the areas to block you know, the delivery of the PPEs um, you know, in schools. So that actually led to a presentation of a risk you know, assessment uh, state of affairs across the provinces, which actually identified two provinces as the low risk uh, provinces, which were highly likely to be in place to have majority of their schools ready by Monday. Four provinces were identified to be in a medium risk you know, category, which meant that the, the likelihood of them to have most of their schools ready was much limited. And of course, there were three provinces that were flagged as high-risk provinces because their distributions were far behind. But I need to also indicate that some of these observations were a factor of the verifiable information that we had received from the provinces by the time we finalized you know, the report. So having made that observation and given the risk assessment um, um, you know, state of affairs, um, we made the final uh, you know, set of observations and recommendations to, um, to the department. Um, part, the main part of which was that we, we took, firstly we took uh, the comments by the heads of departments um, which firstly indicated their acceptance of the report as a correct reflection of the state of affairs across the country. So that was important. And in fact, some of the data and the observations that we've made were confirmed directly as consistent with where things were um, during um, the presentation to the heads of departments. The heads of department, the nine depart provincial departments of education, then also gave us a very lengthy account of the context in which the preparation for readiness was being carried out, with lots of challenges, including uh, procurement you know, challenges, planning challenges, supply side challenges relating to availability of stocks and availability of capacity in the market to quickly you know, roll out um, the deliveries. I must indicate though that we have observed that the preparations that were initiated some three or four weeks back were actually starting to yield reach at a school level only by the middle of last week and we therefore expected that that would continue until the 31st of May. So having observed that and listened to the heads of departments and in particular the fact that the deliveries were continuing, we reached the following final observations, which we ended up presenting to the Council of Education Ministers in the afternoon. One was that progress had been made by the provincial departments. From the picture that we had on the 27th of May, and the national institutions such as Rainwater, who were rolling out the, the deliveries of water to meet the readiness requirements. The second final observation was that an increasing number of schools 
are increasingly meeting the requirements for readiness. Third was that we thought there will be many schools that will, would not have been ready by the end of Sunday, the 31st of May, to receive learners in the schools, and that the greater proportion of which will be in the provinces that have been reported to fall under the high and medium risk categories presented and um, shared with you earlier. This observa observation, you know, obviously we made in the context where um, we invited provincial departments to confirm or disconfirm the observation based on relevant verifiable information which was provided to us by Saturday. That actually created the window for the um, accounting officers at provincial level to still come up with any additional information by Saturday to confirm or disconfirm the overall observation. But generally, there was a, there was a, you know agreement with the heads of departments that the report was reflective of where the country was in respect to the readiness to receive or to open schools on one. June 2020 and um, on that basis we made some uh, secondary recommendations which related to what needed to be done should the schools uh, be opened. So we then came to the conclusion that over and above reopening all the schools, CEM was, uh, we recommended CEM to consider um, giving a partial or delayed reopening of schools depending on each provincial department confirming that schools meet the readiness requirements. Secondly, schools that do not meet the requirements we recommended should remain closed until they did so. But we specifically also recommended under that um, overarching recommendation that the requirements um, should also be uh, clearly prioritized because as they stand they are complex and onerous. The requirements can be understood from critical requirements that schools have to meet to good practice requirements that the schools have to meet. So good practice requirements for instance would be you must have your posters and these sorts of things but critical requirements will refer to um, aspects such as masks, sanitizers, washing, you know, water, running water, and sorts, uh, and that sort. And and uh, the heads of departments, you know, welcomed, you know, those recommendations and agreed to, um, you know, take up some of the, you know, management and intervention recommendations towards finalizing the readiness of schools to reopen. Um, in summary, Minister, I would like to stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kosa, for the presentation. I'm now going to invite Mr. Debo Joala from Rendwater to take us through their presentation. I'm not sure, Terence, if we are able to connect with the CEO. Um, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to ask Debo to to go through it. Can we see the CEO? Okay, colleagues, let me say this in the meantime that you can send us questions, WhatsApp questions to our numbers which are available on the media 
statements and the media invitation which we issued yesterday. But we've also shared the numbers via the different WhatsApp groups that we have. So please, uh, please keep sending those questions. We've already received some questions. We will be reading them so that the minister and the DG and perhaps the MEC can deal with them at the right time. But in the meantime, please prepare those questions. We'll be able to, to answer them. Um, is, are we succeeding in getting the CEO on the line? Um, I do not think so. I think I'm going, I'm going to ask Mr. Jala to please um, take over. That's why you were sent here in the first place, to handle these uh, challenges that we are facing. So we have your presentation over there. As you go through it, we'll also be flighting it on the screen. Thank you so much. Colleagues, after this presentation, we'll then be taking questions. Um, please uh, get ready for that. Uh, program director and uh, good morning or good afternoon minister uh, premier uh, DG uh, I think there is uh, executive mayor colleagues from the department and uh, the northwest province um, Our intervention really uh, emanated uh, from what would have uh, the minister pronounced around the lack of adequate supply or lack of supply at all in some of the schools across uh, the country. But I must say that uh, our intervention data became apparent that it's only going to um, affect uh, the six of the nine provinces, as Houting, Northern Cape and uh, the Western Cape had sufficiently at the provincial level dealt with the uh, requirements uh, of uh, cutting or establishing water supply system within the school premises. So we'll be speaking uh, only of the uh, matters relating to only six of the nine provinces. And the schools that, uh, number of schools that we affected uh, are 3,126, and that's where our scope um, um, uh, well, it's going to cover, um, and and there is uh, two types of uh, schools uh, that uh, we are dealing with. There is a school that has a water tank, but is a bit far from the water source. So we'll be arranging, and we are working on arranging, and to a great extent, we have uh, established water cutting system process. Water is being delivered to those schools, and we have a uh, 2,634 schools which does not have uh, um, either water tank or a reticulated, uh, decent, continuous uh, supply of water. So we are intervening uh, with water tanks in 2,634 schools across. Um, uh, obviously, we mentioned that the provinces, Eastern Cape, the Free State, KwaZulu-Natal, Limpopo, Mpomalanga, and the Northwest. And in the Eastern Cape, um, the total number of schools that we are assisting is 756. In the Free State is 87. In KwaZulu Natal is 1,125. In Limpopo is 475. Um, in the Northwest is 248. And in Bumalang is 435. So in the case of Mpumalanga and uh, Northwest, for instance, the um, number of uh, uh, penetration of uh, schools that already has uh, um, tanks but you no know, cutting of water that is, uh, was taking place is 308 of that 435. In the case of Mpumalanga, in the case of Northwest, 184 schools already have tanks. 
and a great number of them we have started cutting water into. Um, the rest of the other provinces did not have any uh, such uh, uh, tanks already, so we have to put both the tank and the um, and supply water. Um, the number of schools, uh, as I mentioned, in, in the northwest that already has tanks, uh, it's 184, and 47 of them are already ready. Uh, that means we have already cut the water in, and uh, they can open, and uh, where there's no challenge of water anymore. And then 137, we're still addressing them in Mpumalanga 308. We already have, uh, we have tanks in there, and then 17 of them are ready and 291 uh, we are assisting. And uh, in KZN, uh, we, are, we have already assisted with uh, 60 schools, uh, at, or at least at, at 60 schools, and Limpopo 21, and then overall is 145. Um, so when you go to schools that does not have um, um, tanks where we are already uh, supplying tanks, so we've started supplying tanks over the last uh, couple of days. In Eastern Cape, like we mentioned, we have uh, 756 schools to assist. 11 of them, we've got we supply tanks and, uh, and water, and 85 of them, we have um, tanks at the school. We're busy setting up temporary uh, establishments because we're doing it in twofold. So we'll have a uh, Immediately, so that there is water and there is a supply of uh, uh, of water at the school. We won't wait until we build a whole stand or a plinth that is a uh, bricks and mortar based. We'll have a temporary installation, and then we'll, the second phase will be uh, to establish um, the to, to, to build a plinth and uh, some form of uh, uh, of, of uh, stands, depending on the material condition on the ground, and then. And 189 of them, we have already uh, delivered tanks at the school uh, premises. Uh, 289 of those schools, the tanks are at the central point at the district, and they are being delivered uh, to the schools uh, in the next couple of days. In the northwest, uh, we have 84 schools, and then 12 of them are already ready. I mean, 84 in terms of those that require uh, new tanks and then delivered at the uh, school premises uh, are those 12 which are ready and then we have uh, 33 at the central point uh, that are being uh, transported uh, between today and tomorrow to those specific schools and the total number of, of uh, tanks are ready and uh, uh, at the supplier uh, uh, premises which are going to go into schools so at central point are 19. Free state, we have 87 that allocated, and then uh, 20 of them are ready. They can, the kids can move in, and then 30 of them are already on the school premises ground. 63 of them have been delivered at the central point and are being redirected uh, to schools, and 67 are at the central point and uh, within the province and are being delivered. Uh, at, transport arrangement has been made. Uh, with regard to Limpopo, it's 521 total allocated for tanks. Um, 46 of them are ready, and 134 of them are at the uh, supplier premises and are being uh, uh, transported uh, uh, soon to various uh, schools. And that's with recording 138 in total of tanks. So in Bumalanga, we're talking at about 127, and uh, 127 of them are at the central uh, depots of various suppliers, and they have been transported. In KZN, uh, we're talking about 1125, and then the total number of uh, schools that are ready, uh, with, where we already supply the tanks and we fill them with water, it's eight. And then there are some of the schools that were, uh, where we have uh, the tanks at the um, school premises is 65, and uh, the, some of the tanks that are the central point of uh, suppliers is um, um, 31. So we are taking about an, uh, an intervention of about uh, 
626. Okay, if we have to tell you about the current location of tanks. Those in the Eastern Cape, for instance, we have uh, um, extra tanks that are within the province but will be delivered at the school. We have um, 100 tanks uh, in Free State. We have uh, 138 tanks in Limpopo and 395 in KZN. And some of the tanks are being transported from Gauteng uh, to various um, uh, places. I mean, we've got 31 tanks that are moving from Gauteng to Free State and 127 that are being transported from Gauteng to um, Bumalanga and 231 to KZN to top up of the deficit number that we just uh, um, shared with yourselves. And I mean, we, I don't know whether you can see some of the presentations, a part of our presentation, we have various pictures that demonstrate and show a uh, number of interventions, some of them are in trucks that are in transit um, uh, uh, with tanks and some of the tanks that have been installed at various schools uh, that show that the water is already flowing and we are ready to start the school calendar once again. Thank you very much, Elijah, the Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Deboho from uh, Rainwater. We appreciate that presentation. Um, I'm now going to ask Terence to read the first batch of questions which we have received from members of the media. Um, Terence, over to you. Please read slowly uh, because we want to give the the minister and the panel an opportunity to write them down so that they can deal with them. Over to you. Um, the first question is for the minister. It comes from Sidwell Butuka of the Mail newspaper. We have seen several schools around the globe being closed just a few days after they have been reopened because of hundreds of pupils that have tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, given the news and the fact that the virus is spreading so rapidly in South Africa at this stage, do you still believe that it is safe to open schools next week? The second question comes from Tao Mutsuping, who is from SABC. Some private schools have been asking parents to sign indemnity forms. They will not let kids back to school without completing these forms. Is the department firstly aware of this? and where, where schools want to absorb themselves from possible COVID-19 infections, which might happen at the school. The third question comes from Giorgio Gitano of the Business Day. How many private schools have been allowed to reopen across the country, seeing that private schools in the Northern Cape have already opened today? Liolo's second question is, what is the Minister's response to the Education Sector's Union's rejection of the phased reopening of schools? Liolo's third question is, the unions have also called on all schools, even those ready to receive learners, not to reopen if PPEs have not been delivered to all schools across South Africa. What is the Minister's response to this? Are unions frustrating the department's efforts to welcome learners back on 8 June? We have a further question from Jacob Roy from the Report newspaper. Jacob Roy asked, my question is about teachers with chronic diseases. I understand they are supposed to hand a letter to the principals, but will they have to wait until the department approved until the department has approved it, or can they stay home when they handle it while handling this letter? We have a question here for Mr. Godwin Koza. 
Can, can Mr. Koza say which are the provinces that were high risk, medium risk, as well as those that are ready? Can he elaborate on the protests that blocked the deliveries of PPEs? Where were these protests? And did they establish why people would block the delivery of PPEs? And has this issue been resolved? We have a further question from Tsekhofato uh, Mwahi from ENCA. Tsekho asks, what is the plan? What's the plan with the Western Cape, seeing they welcomed learners already? There have been a lot of people saying that schools in Limpopo, as well as the Eastern Cape, aren't ready at all. Are there any plans to go to these areas or any rural area? For now, those are all the questions for now. There's a lot of them that are coming through. But we are going to take this first round of questions and I'm going to ask the ministers to please uh, come through to address the questions that have been asked. Thank you, Minister. No, thank you very much. The first question is about the closing of schools by other countries on an ongoing basis. And my answer is that those closings are informed by circumstances, I think, in those countries, which are, some, I guess, not necessarily ours. I mean, last time, France closed 50 schools. And France has got more than 44,000 schools, 902. So which means in France, 44,000 schools, 848 were still operating. So which means the closing of those schools would have informed by circumstances around those 50 schools. I think yesterday they reported that South Korea closed about 100 schools, 500 schools. In Korea, there are more than 20,000 schools. So which means almost 19,000 schools still operate in Korea. So I'm saying, different circumstances will inform. For instance, in a country we are concerned about your red district zones, your Cape Town, because as teachers started reporting, there were cases of uh, teachers who have been affected, reported. So we'll have a differentiated approach. Because I think also the closing of schools in those countries are informed by circumstances in those countries in specific areas. So France didn't close the whole education sector. It kept 44,848 schools open. So which means the 50 was informed by something. Same Korea, the 500 schools would have been informed because Korea has got more than 20,000 schools. So which means the closing of those 500 schools and the keeping of other 19,000 schools was informed by also conditions. So the point is we're monitoring it. We are being guided by health, and that's why we are even discussing between Gauteng, Western Cape, KZN, and Eastern Cape in those red areas to say, what do, is there anything we can put more to make sure that we have a differentiated approach. And that will inform our reaction, but we won't have an overall answer because it's not an overall issue. That some private schools have been asking parents to sign indemnity. Private schools are completely independent. They operate within the framework of the law to say they shall teach this curriculum, they shall do the following. But in the everyday administration, uh, did you have to help me? We really don't have a, a direct say. So I'm not aware, but I'm also not surprised that I'm not aware because they would not have necessarily have had to tell me that we are getting people to sign indemnity forms. They run their own business. So how many private schools, again, we're saying private schools, small schools, independent schools, schools with special needs, have a different uh, 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 management protocols, because they're independent. 
So what they do, we work with them through the association, rep recognized association representing them. And then that association, on the basis of the agreement that we have, they, using the tools that we are using, they then confirm to us that this school has met the requirements. Therefore, as an association of private schools, we have given them permission to operate. So they, they are in a different dispensation because of the, the way they are run and managed. So it's a different... So there's a quote, so I'm sorry. There's a different plan. Uh, what is the minister's response to education sector union's rejection of the phase opening of schools? Unless I misunderstand the question, what the report of the NECT, and I think that's where the, 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 the difficulty was. The report of the NECT said, Minister and MECs, your systems are not ready even in areas which are non-negotiable, and gave us three, three options allow schools that are ready to operate, disallow schools that are not ready, or just use the week to make sure that everybody is equally ready. And our agreement, and that's the final decision we took on Saturday at CM, that let's not take chances and say this one is ready because the report we're getting from the NECT it's not saying in the 26,000 school, school 1, 2, 3, 4 does not open because it's not ready. So it's generic to say 80% of your schools are not ready. So we're not even sure if you say everybody must go in, if not that 20% will go in. So for safety reasons, we thought we should ask, and we agreed with unions. So the, 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 the response is that we agree with them that we should not have had a phased reopening of schools because there will be that 20 percent that could be the risk factor and therefore use this period to clean up where there are areas so the reaction that the minister agrees with unions that agreed with unions and parents based on our report received from the any city and from provinces that the phase approach might be uh, might, might be risky and as i, as I said uh, even here it's ready, they could have started, but I'm not sure if the next school. So let's just clean our data and be very, very sure that there is no, that in the system we have met all the requirements. The questions about teachers with chronic diseases. Teachers where PPEs have been sent were supposed to have been at school, declared, and that's what I found, declared they are a, a, a challenge, a health challenge, and there are clear protocols about how to what, what, what steps need to be followed. We are supposed to say, for instance, if you are diabetic, then the doctor is supposed to say this diabetes is unmanageable, therefore this teacher cannot come to work. That's the basis. So you don't stay at home without necessarily following those protocols and be granted permission on the basis of what the guidelines say. So teachers are expected to have been in school, they're supposed to have declared their condition, they're supposed to have consulted their doctors, they're supposed to have already given the principal. One school I visited, they had a teacher who's on chemo treatment and the doctor said it's not safe for her to come back and therefore it was granted, not just stay home, was granted permission not to come. The other one declared diabetes, went to the doctor, the doctor said it's managed. It's managed. She can cope. She must come back to work. So it's going to be differentiated. It's not, there's no general answer. And the unions have also called on all schools, even those ready to receive learners, not to open if PPEs have not been delivered. So there can't be a school that is ready to open when PPEs have not arrived. Because that's a precondition for, for reopening. If there are no masks, there are no sanitizers, that school can operate. So they are quite correct. And that's the condition we have said to say, no school, even for teachers, if teachers go to a school and find that there are no sanitizers, there are no PPEs, we are agreeing with unions, they should not operate because it's going to be risky for everybody else who's in that space. So we're in agreement with the points they're making, and that's why we had said provinces must finalize all deliveries, the latest by Wednesday. They had committed, they promised us that they'd finish by Sunday. We thought it was risky because we're not sure 
by the time we met on Saturday that indeed they would have been delivered by Sunday. So we've given them this week to say they must deliver and there must be no school that operates when those PPEs have not been received. Thank you very much. Or visiting rural areas, yes, <clears throat> what I've committed to do is to go to different areas with the DM. The deputy minister was busy with Mpumala. I was in the free state. I think I went to the township. But our feet, because of the challenges around <coughs> movements, the NCT through its networks, through its NGOs, become our feet and eyes to visit rural areas. So we will visit them <coughs> randomly, but we are counting on the NCT doing the work for us and reporting back to us independently. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Minister. There was a question. Uh, DG, I've noted you. You will come through. I just want uh, Mr. Corsa to, to address the question that was uh, directed to him. And thereafter, I'm going to ask you to assist uh, in responding to some of the questions that the Minister was also uh, responding to. Mr. Corsa. I never before have doubted uh, Mr. Mslanga, so that's why I wanted to work straight to the, to the mic. But this time around, we must doubt each other. Every time somebody speaks, you must uh, wait for them to clean. So <clears throat> there were two questions. Uh, the one question is about which provinces were uh, flagged at which category. So the provinces that were identified as you know largely ready were Houting and Western Cape and the provinces that were had a medium uh, rating of readiness were Northern Cape, Free State, Northwest and the Eastern Cape and the provinces that were um, rated with a high risk low readiness level were Limpopo Mpumalanga and KwaZulu Natal. So I, I must just re emphasize the point that I made earlier on about the strictness of this kind of verification and tracking. So the level of strictness, I mean, strictness that we adhere to was akin to that is observed by auditors. So where we did not have verifiable information, we could not take any you know, report, verbal reports and so on. Therefore, the rating, the scoring of these provinces also depended on the level of reporting, that is the provision of the verifiable, you know, information. The protests, where they are, why, and whether they are uh, resolved. Um, I don't have the, the, uh, the details of the um, you know, localities, but uh, a couple of them were in Houting and in other provinces. <clears throat> These were uh, associated with um, local suppliers or loc potential local suppliers of PPEs who wanted the same opportunity to provide PPEs to their own schools. Um, and perhaps it's important to indicate that um, there are several provinces that had actually gone for approaches that involve SMMEs in the provision of the masks and related PPEs, as well as in the distribution of these uh, PPEs from um, warehouses. So, um, and, and that brought its own, you know, complications because 
where provinces had uh, multiple, in fact several, you know, suppliers, that just complicated the logistics of, um, of managing. However, there are a couple of provinces that have gone the route of, um, of, of utilizing SMMEs. The last point I just want to make is that <clears throat> it made methodological sense to spend more effort tracking the PPEs from the provincial level, from procurement to distribution down to the schools. Um, as this material reaches the school, more attention is being made or put into uh, gathering data from each and every school to see how the actual receipt of the learners and the teachers and the preparation at the school level are happening. On Friday, we started rolling out the school-based verification and I can say that the team had got, gotten to about 30 schools, in fact 27 to be precise, and more schools will be visited in the coming couple of days and weeks in order for us to get a much more granular understanding of how the schools are dealing with the final preparations and receipt of learners in schools. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kosa. There are also requests for your presentation. I hope that will make arrangements for that presentation to be, to be made available. Um, Mr. Samuel, can you please come through? I know you want to talk about comorbidities and other issues. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm vertically uh, advantaged. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Minister, uh, Premier, uh, MEC, Bumajoro Baruna, uh, District and Local, Muruti Tabanyani, and colleagues. I'm just going to add a few points. Uh, yes, Mr. Mshanga, maybe let me start first with the the response that Mr. Koza gave about specific areas that experienced protests. Um, those specific areas, as he correctly point, pointed out, the northern part of Gauteng, I think the Pretoria, Soshanguwe area, and the explanation that he provided as the reason for the protest, people saying, we have local capabilities, why are you giving this tender to somebody from outside our area? The second uh, area that experienced this was Eastern Cape, uh, particularly the Oar Tambo uh, region, uh, which experienced the lowest delivery when we received the figures on Saturday and Sunday, which had received probably the lowest. I think the last count that I saw was about 18%. And in there as well was about people who were contesting the fact that the suppliers who, were, who had now successfully responded initially uh, the suppliers who were contracted were the local ones. Uh, when they failed to meet the deadline, then the department resorted to suppliers that uh, demonstrated the capacity to deliver on time. And how you determine that, you go and check the stock in the warehouse before you award a contract to a supplier. Um, and unfortunately, 
uh, at first that was not done because uh, as Mr. Koza indicated, uh, many of the procurement processes were done hurriedly. And I don't want to burden you with the background of initially the whole of government uh, procured through only one supplier called Imperial Logistics for the whole of government. And increasingly, uh, Imperial Logistics could not carry successfully the burden of procuring most of these uh, COVID essentials from overseas. And then provinces were, were then told after about two weeks or so to cancel and reorder, which then caused delays of about three weeks uh, to procure afresh. So those are the two provinces that experienced uh, this, pro this uh, protest. I must also add that these numbers change very fast. Uh, I think Mr. Koza did uh, hint that to indicate that the decision was mainly based on the extensive, extensive work that they had done up to the 27th, updated on Saturday, and the numbers keep changing and they change drastically because provinces were delivering up to yesterday. And as we speak, the deliveries are still continuing. Comorbidities, there are two dimensions to comorbidities. The first dimension is the one that the minister explained, which requires that, uh, in fact, all over the world, whether it's learners, or employees with pre-medical conditions, they are expected to consult with a doctor, and a doctor would provide a report with supporting documents. And the advice that we've been giving in the workshops that we've been running for officials at district and even at provincial level uh, including the association of school principals and the five teacher unions. We took them through these workshops. We said to them, if it is not explicit in the doctor's report that a person must stay at home, then you must go to work. It is only a medical doctor who can make a determination that the pre-medical condition that you have makes you vulnerable to the environment of COVID-19 that we find ourselves in. Only a medical doctor, and we even advise the officials that no official who is not a medical doctor should question the report of a medical doctor, because you are not a medical doctor. It's only a medical doctor who can subject a report of a medical doctor to a review, some review, ask questions, and so on. <clears throat> so that's the first dimension which the minister responded to. The second dimension is the protocol, the process, what happens. We met in the Education Labor Relations Council, and thank you very much to parties in the Education Labor Relations Council especially the chairperson and the general secretary who were able to convene an urgent meeting. A collective agreement was concluded on Saturday on how we deal with comorbidities of educators. I've already signed that collective agreement. We discussed it at HEDCOM and HEDCOM made its inputs. The inputs were factored into the collective agreement that I signed yesterday. So we are awaiting employee parties, in other words, unions, now to sign. It will be a protocol that determines the step-by-step -step process of how teachers should go about dealing with comorbidities. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I thought the, the minister re responded to the issue of the indemnity form. Well, schools do issue indemnity forms, not only independent schools, including 
public schools. But we generally take a dim view to indemnity schools because people think that they absolve them from vicarious liability. And that is not the case at all. And I'm sure if you follow cases of two learners who tragically uh, were tragically demised in Gauteng uh, towards the end of last year, you'll, you'll attest to the point that I'm making. Signing an indemnity form does not exonerate the school and the state from taking responsibility where there was negligence. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thanks, DJ, thanks, Minister, and thanks, Mr. Corsa. I'm going back to Terence now for the second round of questions that we received via the WhatsApp lines. And we will then give the Minister the opportunity to, to respond to those questions. Uh, some of them are follow up questions, I've seen them, and some of them are questions which other media people are asking. So. If the question has already been asked by someone else, um, we will not go through it uh, because it will be addressed uh, when the others are attended to. Uh, please uh, take us through the questions. Uh, thank you very much. We still have a few more questions. The first one comes from Mr. Uh, from Newton, Africa. My question is for Debo uh, from Rainwater. How many schools in the Northwest do not have water and how many have been provided? And does Debo does he think this week is enough to provide uh, water to all the schools? So that question again from Zinje. How many schools in the Northwest do not have water and how many have been provided? And do you think that this week is enough to provide water to all those schools? The second question is for the Minister. Unions say they, have, they will meet with you on the 11th on the issue of readiness. Does this mean there will be no school until then? We have another question here that has come from Chareshwa News. It's for the minister. What should learners and teachers do if they only receive one mask? Can we say PPEs were issued if only one mask was received? Then we have Tami Twada from Bantu News. What is the department's plan with regard to the national, the, the national school nutrition program? We have a second question from support from ENCA. Where learners share textbooks, what plan has been made by the department? The second question is, what would happen should a teacher test positive for COVID-19? We have a further question from Sikhe Mavoso, who is from the independent media. Sikhe's question is, please direct, oh, <laughs> this question is for the minister. What actions have been taken or will be taken against the suppliers that misrepresented their ability to supply the PPEs since the action have contributed towards the delay in the reopening of schools? A further question from Nazir at Glow TV. Seeing that class sizes will be smaller, where would teachers come from for extra classes? Will feeding schemes also be introduced at the start of the reopening of schools? And would scholar patrols continue to function under level three? And the last thing set of questions is what is the system now doing for bookmarkings? And I think that's, that's the final question, thank you. All right, um, I'm going to ask you to, to go first, uh, Mr. Joala from Brandwater. Um, please come through to deal with the question asked about water provision and thereafter I'm going to ask the Minister to come through as well to deal with the rest of the questions. Uh, 
Thank you once again, uh, um, In response to that question, um, as also um, I thought I would have mentioned earlier, but uh, clarify that the work that we mentioned that we have done, that mammoth amount of work that we have put together, it was only put together within a period of about five days. So we only got the money on the 26th, which was last week. So we have, within the, the, the four or five days of that period, a lot of work went into this. And we are quite confident uh, when we respond to the question asked that uh, by weekend, all the schools will have uh, water and the water will be flowing. Uh, tanks will be there. Uh, in the case of uh, Northwest, for instance, we had mentioned that 184 um, schools already have tanks and uh, 37 of them have been filled with water in the last two days and today we are doing 68 uh, 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 schools and tomorrow we are cutting water into 69 schools. So the rest of the schools, uh, tanks and tankers, uh, we will be cutting water and tanks will be installed throughout the week. So we're quite confident we can say safely to the nation that by weekend, which is uh, Friday, Saturday, all the schools uh, that we have been asked to do in the region of uh, 3,126 will have uh, water that is flowing and children will be uh, safe to get into those schools come the 8th. Thank you very much. Okay, I think the first question has been answered by, answered by Tebu Ho. About the meeting with unions, we normally communicate with the secretary, so they have not communicated with us, so I am not aware of the meeting of the 11th. So I still expect or hope that they will uh, send an invitation. Uh, we normally invite them or they invite us, so I've not received, so I have no answer. On the National School Nutrition Program, that's our plan that we need to urgently start providing nutrition, not only to learners that have returned. So for those learners that are returning, there are plans. We have trained uh, the school nutrition team that prepares food on new and different ways of, prepare, of preparing under the health requirements. So we will provide nutrition to, your, to the grades that are phased in. We would have wished also even to provide nutrition for grades that we have not phased in. But I had requested the sector and the MS to say, maybe we need to wait a little get ourselves to acclimatize to the new environment, manage that which we are still struggling to get right before we can introduce new programs. So there is intention to start the nutrition, but we just really need to find our feet in this new environment, be comfortable that we are able to manage this new environment we find ourselves in before we can get into more programs, but we have intentions to do that. Around the sharing of books, it really would be undesirable to have learners com continue to share books, to share equipment, to share uh, 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 the necessary, uh, to share yeah, uh, 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 books, equipment, uh, because it will even in some instances, if they have to share a book, it will undermine physical distancing, and those are some of the areas we are paying attention to. And bearing in mind that. As much as we have to do things differently, there's no different money that has come into the system. So we keep on reprioritizing monies that were in the system to meet the new demands. So we're t taking from Mary to help uh, leading, but we, we ideally should not uh, allow a situation where children or learners share books and undermine physical distancing. Uh, or there was a question also about what happens if a teacher tests positive. We follow the health protocols. There are clear lines to say if you are screened with high temperature, 
you are, suppo are supposed to go for testing. If you are tested, you have to go to isolation. So it's the same protocols that apply generally to the public that will apply even with us. So we're using the standard protocols. If a, a teacher tests, tests positive, they can't come to school, then they have to really be a responsibility of the health sector as to how they manage them, whether they go into isolation, they go for med medical treatment, but it's the same protocols that will apply to anybody. And teachers are also uh, affected by the same. There was a question about what we do with suppliers who are not delivering. Provinces are the ones who are procuring. So provinces are the ones which are procuring the PPs. The only program or the only thing that we are procuring as national is water in partnership with a, a, a Department of Water and Sanitation. And even there, it's a joint responsibility. There are water tankers that the provinces are procuring we are supplementing what provinces are procuring. But in terms of relationships with suppliers, it's provinces that would have appointed the suppliers, so it's provinces that are supposed to manage the suppliers. All we do is to monitor, to say, here's a problem. We had said to we'll bring PPs by Friday. They have not come. We have gone to your supplier's uh, 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 warehouse. There's nothing. In some instances, we even went to their houses to say we thought perhaps your suppliers kept supplies in the garage. We've even gone to their houses. They don't have the, the equipment. So again, those, yeah, those entrepreneurs are managed by provinces. Uh, I hope I've kept, I've answered all the questions. Uh, on? Oh, on class sizes, we are anticipating a major challenge and we are taking one step at a time. And that's why in every school, I'm, I'm, we really want to estimate to say, you had five grade 12s, now we have to turn them into eight, which means you are using your grade 11 teachers to do that. So if we face in grade 11, it means the grade 10 teachers are going to come in. So what we're looking at as provinces is to look at our relief teachers because we have a list of experienced teachers who really come and assist us when there's a need in the system. If there's a teacher who's not well, they come and assist. But we're also looking at our database of teachers who have applied. So we have a good size of young people who have qualified as teachers that we have not been able to place as long as three years. So there's a huge list of young, highly qualified uh, T qualified teachers that we have not been able to, uh, to, to, to appoint. They are in our database, both at provincial and national. So there again, we are quite confident. So the issue is going to be the resources to say, if we take them in, we have to discuss with Treasury to say, how do we pay them? But there are also plans or discussions about, uh, because other activities have been reduced to platoon, because most of the schools I visited, DG were saying to me, after grade 10, 10, we will not be able to, to take anything else with the splitting of classes. So which means the principal is agreeing. Which means in terms of space and teachers, when we start phasing in grade 8 and 9, there's going to be a major problem. So we might even have to go to Treasury to say there is no way we can continue because, which is what I always say, as education, we're not only an education institution. We also are a support system for parents. They leave their children with us to educate them, to look after them and take care of them. So as the economy begins to open up, we're going to be under immense pressure to also create a spaces that some people are falling to, my child is in grade nine, so what happens to me? My child is four years, is in grade four. What happens to me when I'm work, at work? So there's a great pressure or well, there's major pressure on the system to open up as, as quickly as possible, to take as many learners as possible, and that we are working on plans. And I do hope that when we get to that level, your grade eight, 
and grade nines, we will be able to get help from Treasury. But uh, we are aware of the eminent crisis that we are going to confront. Uh, indeed, colleagues, as the minister indicated, uh, if anything happens uh, within the prison of a school, uh, whether it's a teacher or a learner or a non-teaching staff uh, who presents symptoms that uh, eventually uh, are confirmed to have tested positive, uh, the, the, there are what we call standard operation procedures that we issued uh, for all schools. So the standard operation procedures have been issued by the sector and they stipulate clearly step by step what schools are expected to do. And as the minister said, the, the logical step would be the Department of Health will then begin to kick in. Minister, I just wanted to draw the attention of the public and the media to the directions that the minister referred to in the speech that she presented this morning. Uh, section 10 of the directives, subsection 2 and subsection 3. Uh, subsection 2 says, with respect to class sizes, minister, it says, in order to ensure compliance with health, safety, and social slash physical distancing requirements, school facilities must operate at 50% or less uh, of their capacity at a given time. So, principal is aware of that. 50% or less, so that you meet the health, safety and social distancing 1.5 meters in between like here so if you don't do that you won't be able to meet that subsection 3 then provides a solution to this because some schools have got an overall enrollment learner enrollment of 1005 some 2000 some more than 2000 learners it says subject to the sub direction 4 Schools may consider and apply any of the following available timetable models suitable for their context and functionality. And some of them the minister referred to. It says A is da daily and weekly rotation. In other words, yeah, daily and weekly rotation um, uh, timetable. The second one is bi-weekly rotation. Um, the, the, the daily weekly rotation, maybe let me explain. If you've got, for instance, 1,002 or 1,400 uh, uh, learners, then you have to divide them into two groups. Group one would attend Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Group two would attend Tuesday and Thursday. The subsequent week, the first group would then attend on Tuesday and Thursday, and group two would attend on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The, so that's, that's a daily uh, and weekly rotation. B says bi-weekly rotation. Bi-weekly rotation, it means group one attends this week, group two attends next week. So, whilst one group is at home, the other group will be attending to observe social distancing. And then the platooning one, the minister covered it, it's well known by all of us. That's model number three. Model number four is what we call a traditional model. In other words, it's a timetable that this school followed before lockdown. Normal, quarter to seven, up to two o'clock, you go home. We refer to it as traditional 
uh, model. And then the last one, which is number five, is the hybrid of the ones that we refer to. Thank you very much, Minister. I forgot to respond to the question about the number of masks. The instruction to provinces was that they must buy two masks for teachers and two for learners. And if they receive one, I think through the NCT or through the office, we need to be notified because as much as provinces say there's a scarcity of cloth masks, DTI had given us a list of factories in the country who, because of the lockdown, were unable to do their usual work, would be able to assist government with mass using the, the correct material. So we are ready to intervene and activate those factories. And that's what made Gauteng and Western Cape to move ahead. Western Cape went strictly to factories in the Western Cape to get them to produce masks to save jobs. Houghton did the same, get factories that are upper, your, 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 your factories to make masks to save jobs. But there was a progressive decision to say, also give locals an opportunity to be able to participate in the procurement and give, give cooperatives. So if those cooperatives are not coping, we should not compromise the fact that we have given directives that is two months per learner and two months per, per, per educators. And we then finally then agree that educators must get screens, especially educators teaching children who are hard of hearing because they lip read and they also have to read to, to, to really have facial expressions to explain to them what is being discussed. So. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard, so there shouldn't be shortcut. It's two. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Thank you, DG. Thank you, HOD Simaswe. Um, <laughs> Mr. Joala from Rendwater. Um, yeah. Mr. Mark Monroe from Anglo American. Um, Mr. Paul Kuno from the Rustenburg Local Municipality. Um, also from the District uh, Municipality. Premier Mukoro and um, all other partners that are here that I might have omitted, Mr. Corsa and um, the officials. Thank you so much for supporting us and this media briefing. This was the second school that we're visiting today in the Northwest province. We are still proceeding to the third school. It is called Manape Secondary School. That's where we are proceeding to now. Um, with those words, we've come to the end of this media briefing. We will continue to engage with you using the platforms that we have. Uh, we have seen that there are a lot more questions that are still coming through, but we will not be able to deal with all the questions uh, in one day. It's a work in progress. We hope that you'll continue to work with us as we try to get the education program back on track again. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
Ama ben ne kadar? Beş. Ne